running between the spa town of Bath and the coastal resort of Bournemouth, as well as traversing the Somerset levels to Glastonbury, Wells, Bridgewater and Burnham. There was once the Somerset and Dorset's joint railway. Over half a century since its closure, the legacy of this railway is still to be found in its bridges, its tunnels, its track beds, buildings, or viaducts. And whether it was the variety of traction which ran over its rails, the customs peculiar to this friendly line, or simply the beauty of the landscapes through which it passed, the s and has had more books written about it than any other railway in Britain, going some way to legitimising the claim that this is England's best-loved lost railway. Acting as a gateway by rail to the city of Bath is Bath Spa Station, 106 miles and 71 chains from London Paddington. Built by Brunel as part of the construction of his Great Western Railway, the station reflects the elegant architecture of this world-famous city. But for many years, Bath Spa was not the only major railway station to serve passengers. Between 1870 and 1966, Bath Queen Square, or as it was latterly known, Bath Green Park, also saw the arrival and departure of trains for the Somerset and Dorset Railway along its main line to Bournemouth. Running for 71 miles over the Mendip Hills and shadowing the course of the River Stour for much of its journey through Dorset, the main line to Bournemouth opened to passengers in 1874. Perhaps its most famous charge was the Pines Express, which ran daily between Manchester and Bournemouth, with double-headed engines required to traverse the precipitous gradients of the S&D's route. In the summer months, these trains would be packed with day-trippers and holiday-makers bound for the coast. Today, the station building remains in good order. The trains and passengers may have gone, but beneath the station's delightful canopy, we today find the building home to shops, visitors and events. With part of a track bed now home to a car park. It is heartening that this structure remains in place when so many similar buildings succumbed to demolition. So our journey to explore what remains of the Somerset and Dorset Railway begins by crossing the River Avon. The fine iron latticework of this railway bridge remains, though the mode of transport it carries has changed. Here was once Bath Junction, where trains for Bournemouth took the curve away from the metals of the Midland Railway and onto the rails of the S&D proper. The course of the railway at this point has benefited from an afterlife of sorts, as the two tunnels greenway, which runs for a number of miles hence. The steep gradient out of the stations demanded that many trains be banked all the way to the summit. Whilst many of the bridges along this stretch of route have been replaced, this original structure on Hiscox Drive remains. so trains would pass into the small bore of Devonshire Tunnel. With funnels billowing exhaust, they would emerge 447 yards later and into Lincoln Vale. Soon afterwards, trains would enter Coombe Down Tunnel, once the UK's longest without intermediate ventilation. The smoke-filled conditions in the tunnel were notorious among engine men and on one occasion had fatal consequences. On the 20th of November 1929, overcome by fumes as they ascended through Coombe Down Tunnel towards Bath, driver Jennings and fireman Pierce collapsed at the controls of Type 280 locomotive number 89. 
careering down Lincoln Vale and into Bath Yard at up to 60 miles per hour, the runaway derailed and slammed into the railway clearing house building. The debris struck and killed Railway Inspector Norman, who was on duty at the time, and Mr J Loder, a clerk and employee of the railway, who was making his way home through the yard. Driver Jennings survived the crash, but succumbed to his injuries en route to hospital. Both Fireman Pierce and Guard Wagner escaped with serious injuries. Although this was the only accident on the S&D to be caused by the intoxicating conditions of the tunnel, it was not the only accident to which the railway bore witness. On the 19th of August 1949, on the branch to Highbridge, between Ashcott and Shapwick, a passenger train collided with a narrow-gauge diesel locomotive belonging to a local peat works. The passenger train careered off the tracks and into the canal. Fortunately, the accident claimed no lives and it is reported that rather than remove the stricken locomotive, it was cut up on site by a breakdown crew. Not so fortunate were the 15 lives claimed by the head-on collision of two 060 locomotives on the outskirts of Radstock on the 7th of August 1876. A combination of signaller error, inadequate training and communication, together with a number of other factors, saw to it that this would be the worst accident in the S&D's history. We exit Coombe Down Tunnel after 1,829 yards and into Horsecombe Vale on a 1 in 55 down gradient. Almost immediately, trains cross the impressive Tucking Mill Viaduct. Some four miles since the glazed canopy of Bath Green Park, we arrive at our first station, Midford. Closed to the traffic of goods in 1963 and passengers in 1966, the platform remains in situ, but gone are the waiting room, booking office and signal box, which once populated this neat rural station. We depart, and in so doing cross Midford Viaduct, upon which the single track railway became a double track for a number of miles hence. With eight arches, each with a span of 50 feet, the railway crossed road, river, canal, and the closed Bristol and North Somerset Railway. Shadowing Wellow Brook for this part of its course, the Greenway reaches its conclusion. But not so the track bed which carried trains beneath this bridge and through what is now a stables. Crossing the splendid Ford Road viaduct but a few moments later. Thus we reach the fine village of Wellow and its station of the same name. Opened on the 20th of July, 1874, the station was well used, as even into the 20th century, buses reached the village only once a week. Now a private dwelling, the weather vane is a reminder of the purpose this building once served, and those with a keen eye will spot the station canopy, which now shelters the house's residence. Littleton Lane presents one with a view of the railway's course, just identifiable as the darker horizontal line crossing this wheat field from right to left at the picture's centre. And the bridge under which trains subsequently passed. They would find their onward journey somewhat difficult now, with the path of the railway having been backfilled in the years since closure. We reach what is the first halt on the line, and also the last station on the S&D to open, Shoscombe and Single Hill Halt. Opened on the 23rd of September 1923, the station did not match the homely style of other stations on the route. 
Instead, the cast concrete structure is suggestive of the economies railways of this sort were obliged to make. Shoskeman's single hill halt has gone, with an information board commemorating the station's presence. And only these bridge abutments to speak of the railway's crossing. To the west of Shoscombe village, we encounter perhaps the most surprising and innovative use of one of the railway's former structures, with a home now tucked beneath the arches of this viaduct. The leafy vales, which have been our companions hitherto, give way now to the urban as we enter Radstock from the east. A vital mining town in the North Somerset coalfields, Radstock may have had two stations, but it had many more collieries. The Somerset and Dorset Railway opened Radstock North on the 20th of July 1874, about a year after the GWR opened their competing station in the town. Waterloo Road car park represents the station's eastern end. Hereabouts was a shed for banking engines, which would assist goods trains up the following seven and a half miles to Masbury Summit and its punishing one in 50 gradient. Having departed Radstock, S&D locomotives would proceed over the appropriately named Five Arches Viaduct, which carried trains over the GWR's metals. A little while later, trains would reach the next station. Opened as Midsummer Norton until 1898, the station went through a number of varying names when it closed in 1966 as Midsummer Norton South. Today, the station is home to the Somerset and Dorset Railway Heritage Trust, and the first of three railways which occupy the S&D's trackbed. For the next mile, visitors can ride the S&D's rails and relive the railway's days of glory. Continuing our journey, we encounter Chilcompton Tunnel, Originally a single bore tunnel, the down tunnel on the right, the up tunnel was constructed to facilitate the widening of the line. Continuing our journey, this is the track bed atop the embankment which carried trains into Chilcompton. Where they crossed this bridge on Fry's Well, before passing beneath another bridge on Baker's Lane. Trains would then arrive at Chilcompton Railway Station. Like other stations on the line, Chilcompton was home to a small goods yard and also housed a water tower which was used by banking engines as they returned to Radstock. Today, some brickwork can be found, but otherwise the station has been altogether lost. We travel onward towards our next station. Situated 17 miles from Green Park Station is Binniger. The station handled traffic and goods from nearby quarries and stoneworks, and, like other stations on the route, betrayed its rural character with the presence of a cattle pen and loading dock. 
Today, the site is occupied by a private residence, with all traces of the station having been swept away. Having ascended the gradient from Radstock, trains would reach the summit of the line, a little over 800 feet above sea level. Banking engines would see their charge over the summit, before themselves returning to Radstock. So we arrive at Masbury. Picturesque though it may be, the truth is that the station never saw heavy passenger footfall. Indeed, from the 26th of September 1938, the station was downgraded and lived the rest of its life as an unstaffed halt. Taken from bridge number 70, this is approximately the same view today. Now a private residence, steps are being taken to restore the property to its former glory. The building nearest the picture was the booking office and waiting room, followed by the stone foundations of the 20 lever signal box. In the miles between Masbury and our next point of call, some of the railway's most extraordinary structures are still to be found. Among them, the stately Hamwood Viaduct which crosses this deep wooded ravine, itself home to the Hamwood and Windsor Hill quarries, from which stone was transported by rail. A quarter of a mile later, we face the south portal of Windsor Hill Old Tunnel. Cut through to the drop, it is 239 yards in length and still makes for an impressive sight. It is called the Old Tunnel because the new tunnel, opened in 1892, can also be found. Standing here at the south portal of the new tunnel, one can appreciate the ominous, if not outright imposing scale of its construction in what would have been a remote part of the line. Having crossed Forum Lane, we stand on the track bed, but the architectural wonders of the railway continue. For half a mile later, one can still witness the glory of Bath Road Viaduct. A Grade two listed structure that is 75 feet high and 118 yards long, comprising six 50-foot spans. Notice the two different materials of stone and brick used in its construction, once again reflecting the efforts undertaken to widen this stretch of line. Now fenced off, we stand on the viaduct's southern end facing north. The track bed on the northern margin of Shepton Mallet hardly prepares one for the S&D's most breathtaking structure Charlton Viaduct. The sight of the warehouses brings us to our next point of call, Shepton Mallet, Charlton Road. The Charlton Road appellation was present to distinguish the station from the GWR's Shepton Mallet High Street to the west. The main station buildings were on the up platform, with a 26 lever signal box on the down platform, overseeing access to the copious goods yards, stoneworks and limeworks on the extensive station site. After the viaducts and tunnels we have seen, it is disheartening to find no trace of the station today. The area is now home to warehouses and industrial units. A mile to the south on Woodstone Lane, the parapets of a filled-in bridge under which the train has passed. And the onward journey, betraying no sign of the railway. Occupying a delightful position was once Presley Viaduct.
After being deemed unsafe, it was demolished in 1993. Three miles since departing Shepton Mallet, trains would arrive at Evercreech New. Originally Evercreech Village, its name changed months after opening in 1874. One of the smaller stations on the Bath to Bournemouth line, it was notable for handling considerable milk traffic, in addition to lime from the Evercreech Lime and Stone Company. Today, nothing of the station is to be found. Here lie the mortal remains of Pecking Mill Viaduct, today obscured by a verdant tree and undergrowth. The steel span has been removed to accommodate the many HGVs which speed through on this busy road. Slowing to 25 miles per hour to account for a sharp southeasterly curve, trains would arrive at Evercreech Junction. A junction because from here one could alight for trains west to Glastonbury, Wells, Bridgewater, Highbridge and Burnham-on-Sea. Known as the Branch, we shall return to explore it later on. Preceding entry to Evercreech Junction, trains would pass through extensive sidings before stopping outside the main station buildings, including the station master's house sat on the down platform. And to some extent, they can still be seen today. No doubt today's drivers do not miss the level crossing which once brought traffic here to a grinding halt. Two miles later we find this bridge across White Lane. The same bridge is enshrouded in the trees and equally evidence of the railway at this point has been concealed by the intervening years. But a quarter of a mile later, on this deep, warren-like lane, we find these bridge abutments. The bridge carried trains into this field, and subsequently across the Reading to Taunton line, where further abutments to be found. Trains continued their southerly curve across this embankment and a viaduct which has long since gone. Though it can be seen in this fine picture. <coughs> Thus trains reach the next station, Cobb. Happily, the main station building still stands and is in private ownership. Only ever a small station, Cole is noteworthy because it was here that the lines of the Somerset Central and the Dorset Central Railways met in 1862, ultimately forming the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. The Somerset Central Railway opened on the 28th of August 1854 from Glastonbury to Highbridge Wharf, with the Dorset Central Railway opening between Wimborne and Blandford in 1860. Realising that potentially lucrative financial opportunities could arise from an alliance, the Dorset Central Railway and the Somerset Central Railway extended each of the lines to the village of Cole, opening these extensions on the 3rd of February 1862. Seven months later, on the 1st of September, the two railways were amalgamated by an Act of Parliament to form the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. The new company was quick to realise that they may profit by extending towards Bath, which saw the construction of what would become the main line we explore today. This was opened on the 20th of July, 1874. Between Cole and the next station, the rural charm of this line is still evident, and one can imagine how pleasant the journey by train must have been.
we bid farewell to the countryside as we arrive in the town of Wincanton, where once the S&D had a station. The station building behind the locomotive was not dissimilar to that which we saw at Cole. Famous for its race course, it is little wonder that the station was equipped to handle a great deal of horse box traffic. However, unlike Cole, the station no longer stands and is now the site of housing. Here we see the track bed to the south of Wincanton and the site of Marsh Lane level crossing. Journeying only a little further, we reach Templecombe. At approximately halfway between Bath and Bournemouth, this was one of the most important stations on the route. Here, the Somerset and Dorset Railway had an extensive goods yard and sidings. The station itself was neither owned nor operated by the S&D. It belonged instead to the London and South Western Railway. With its large canopies and striking Art Deco style signal box, the station had all the trappings of a vital interchange. Extensively remodelled in the years that have passed, only the platform upon which we stand is now in service. S&D trains were permitted to use the station, but the process was less than straightforward. We see the course of the Somerset and Dorset Railway on this map, with Bath to the north and Bournemouth to the south. Running perpendicular to the line, the London and South Western Railway, the so-called West of England Main Line, which is still in operation. Situated to the west of Templecombe itself, we find the station. At the centre, we see Bridge 152 carrying Throop Road, upon which we now stand, facing north towards Bath. Before passing beneath the bridge, southbound through trains climbed an embankment, the course of which is now occupied by a road. Entering Templecombe Station, Somerset and Dorset trains would occupy the north side of the island platform, where the trees now grow behind the old signal box. Once ready for departure, a pilot engine would be attached to the rear of the southbound train and hauled out of the station back onto the Somerset and Dorset Railway's main line. So we return to Bridge 152, and we imagine our train facing us head-on, ready to continue its journey beneath us. There was, in fact, a small platform, Templecombe Lower, squeezed in between Bridge 152 and Bridge 153, but so short was this platform that it could barely accommodate a carriage. Instead, it was used for crew changeovers, or else trains were held at the platform for passengers who had arrived late on the upper platform. Today, the site of Templecombe Lower is overgrown, and the view of Bridge 153 obscured. South of Templecombe, rails of another kind now occupy the course of the S&D. Here we find the Gartell Light Railway. A narrow gauge railway running for three quarters of a mile, it has four stations. As can be seen, there are a great many signals operated from two signal boxes. Thus we reach the Light Railway's southern terminus. From thence, it was just under a mile to the next station. The smallest station on the line, Henstridge had a platform 150 feet in length, with a small siding on the up line. Today, it is all gone. However, on Station Road, we find these rather ornate crossing posts and gate, long since fastened shut. With Henstridge behind us, we leave Somerset and begin our journey through Hardy's County, Dorset. And it is not long before we reach our next station. Opened on the 31st of August 1863, Stallbridge housed its cluster of station buildings on the up platform. 
Here too was a passing loop upon this single track stretch of line. Approximately the same view. Nothing of the station remains today, where now a factory occupies the site. For the next three miles after Stallbridge, the railway passed through some fine Dorset countryside, whereupon it made its first crossing of the River Stour. So we reach our next point of call. Sturminster Newton was one of the line's more substantial stations. This delightful photograph shows the characteristic charm of the platforms, with the wooden shelter on the down line and the signal box at the southern end of the up platform. Not shown in this instance were the sizeable sidings and goods yards with cattle pens, cattle loading dock, 7-ton hand crane, a milk loading stage, goods shed and more. We stand at the station's southern end. Whilst there is nothing obvious here to denote the presence of the railway, just north of the station efforts have been made to commemorate its role. Beginning here and occupying the S&D's track bed for the next 14 miles is the North Dorset Trailway, allowing cyclists and walkers to journey through the countryside at leisure. And indeed, after three miles, we find the next station. For many, Shillingston typifies the attractive rural station of a bygone era. Happily, all is not lost, for the station has been restored and the track laid to recreate the halcyon days of the railway. So we depart. Facing north towards Shillingston, we see the curve of the tree line towards the bottom of the picture, denoting the railway's course. The journey onward continues as the Somerset and Dorset Railway pass through some of the finest scenery on the route. Running to the east of the idyllic village of Stourpain, we return to ground level and mark the presence of the railway embankment and the site of the next station. Opened on the 9th of July 1928, Stourpain and a Western Halt was a latecomer to the railway and similar in style to Shoscombe and Single Hill Halt with its simple concrete structure and meagre platform shelter. Today, the station lies on private land, but from the adjacent footpath, part of the skeletal concrete structure is still visible. Meandering by the River Stour for the next two and a half miles, we track the railway into the next station. Thus we arrive at Blandford. Having been a single line from Templecombe, the line became double-tracked once more upon reaching this station and remained so for the next eight miles. 
Viewed from bridge 194, we face south and see the station has, by this point, seen better days. The goods yard was of a fair size, and south of the station, there was a spur of line to an army camp. But the spur had only an ephemeral existence. No more will I go to Blandford Forum. We stand on the same bridge and face the same direction, but the view is altogether different. Rails from the days of the s and can still be found embedded in what is now a car park. From the left of the picture, we see the tree line curve down towards us. Carrying the railway out of Blandford was a viaduct which cut through where there is now a supermarket. And here is a picture of it in place after the line's closure. Sadly, it was not to last, and much of the viaduct was demolished in 1978. All that remains of the viaduct today could be found on the riverbank. The lattice girder bridge, which connected with similar brick arches on the south, are both gone. Thus, the SD crossed the River Stour for the final time. And with the line speed of up to 70 miles per hour at this point, trains could easily make up for lost time. Today, the track bed is flanked by luscious tree growth as we approach the next station. Much of Charlton Marshall Holt's passenger footfall came from the pupils of a local girls' school at the beginning and end of each term. According to some accounts, drivers found it difficult to find the station owing to poor lighting on the platform. The steps to each platform are still present, and the structure is in altogether good condition given that it was closed in 1956. We see Bridge 203 from the down platform, where one can also find the concrete posts which held the station's running board. Our arrival at the next station is heralded by Bridge number 215. and next to it, steps leading up to the platform. Opened in 1860, Spetsbury came an unstaffed halt in 1934. Facilities were basic, with no electricity or gas, and it is thought water had to be delivered in churns. Whilst rails have not returned to Spetsbury, Steps have been taken to take care of the station's remains and to enhance the environment. Among these efforts, the erection of a replica disc and crossbar signal. We bid farewell to Spetsbury and journey along the track bed for a little over two and a half miles before arriving at the next station. Situated in the village of Sturminster Marshall, the station was originally given this name, but this was changed in 1863 to Bailey Gate, so as, it is speculated, to avoid confusion with Sturminster Newton several miles north. Viewed from the long since demolished bridge above the station, we see the main cluster of station buildings on the down platform, and to the left of this, the United Dairy sidings, which handled milk deliveries to London. All of this is gone, with Bailey Gate Industrial Estate now in its place. Here, on the estate's southern perimeter, we trace the railway's southbound journey. We arrive at the crossing house on Knoll Lane, with its target gates intact and lengths of rail embedded in what is now the driveway.
we reach the site of Corfmullen Junction. Though unidentifiable in the undergrowth, the railway split at this point, with trains for Bournemouth diverging to the right, and services for Wimborne bearing left. We will briefly see what remains of the line to Wimborne. The only noteworthy feature en route is the so-called Lady Wimborne Bridge, whose unique ornate style can be accounted for by the fact that the railway was obliged to pass over land belonging to Canford Manor. So trains from the Somerset and Dorset Railway would arrive at Wimborne. Opened in 1847 and closed altogether in 1977, it is as if the station, which was located here, never existed. We return to the site of Corfmullen Junction and begin our final leg of the journey south towards Bournemouth. Having taken the points to Broadstone, trains would arrive at Corfmullen Halt a mile later. Resembling Charlton Marsh and Halt, the residents of Corfmullen had long lobbied for a station. It arrived in 1928, sitting in the shadow of Bridge 235 before closing in 1956. The cutting, which the platform inhabited, has since been filled in and the bridge demolished. It is hard to believe there was ever a station here on Wimbledon Road. After a further mile and a half, we arrive at Broadstone Junction. Innocuous though it may be, it was here that the S&D's rails came to an end. We face north towards the junction, which enters from the left. At this point, the S&D's rails merged with the metals of the London and South Western Railway, all the way to Bournemouth. Approximately the same position today on what is now Wentworth Drive. So we arrive at the next station. Broadstone was a busy junction station, handling as it did traffic for the S&D and the London and South Western Railway. Viewed from the south, from Bridge 79, Broadstone had four platform facings. There was the usual array of associated buildings, but very little by way of protection from the elements for those passengers waiting for their train. The same view today reveals that much of the site is now a leisure centre. The main body of the station was situated here on the tennis courts. Overlooking the site, the former railway hotel still stands with its enduring characteristic Victorian architecture. As mentioned, the next seven miles saw trains using London and South Western rails and calling at the same company's stations. After Branksome, s and trains would take the points at Branksome Junction and pass through what is now Bournemouth Traincare Depot. Passing through the yard, trains would reach their final port of call. Opened in 1871 and operational for 91 years, Bournemouth West was the terminus for s and trains, but it was also the terminus for services from Waterloo. Viewed eastward toward the buffer stops, this photograph was taken two years before closure finally occurred in 1965. The same view today. The station site is now a car and coach park. The station was temporarily closed during the electrification of the London Waterloo to Bournemouth line, with the closure becoming permanent not long after. 
Here is the view from the corner of Queen's Road and Norwich Avenue of the station frontage. With an altogether different view today. Here, 71 miles since departing Bath Green Park Station, we reach the end of our journey along the main line. But our journey to explore what remains of the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway is far from over. We leave Bournemouth and the southern terminus of the S&D. Returning north, we see the route of the S&D's main line from Bath. But the oldest part of the line ran between Evercreech Junction and Highbridge, with later extensions to Wells, Bridgewater and Burnham. The company intended to capitalise upon the transport of coal to and from South Wales, as well as what they hoped would be lucrative passenger traffic, which would see holiday makers travel by rail from Burnham to Bournemouth and beyond. Only partially realised, such expectations were not exceeded, so that the branch, as it was known, lived much of its life as a quintessentially rural and remote line. Thus we return to Evercreech Junction, and so begin our exploration of this lost railway. Forget motor cars, get rid of anxiety, and here, to the rhythm of the Somerset and Dorset's joint railway, Dream again that ambitious Victorian dream which caused this long railway still to be running through deepest, quietest, flattest, remotest, least spoiled Somerset. Located on the A37, we reach Pill, our first stop on the journey to Burnham. After it had become a halt, John Betjeman remarked that I doubt there is a quieter, sadder sight in Somerset than Pill when the train has left and it sinks back into silence. Close to goods in 1953 and passengers in 1966, the station buildings have since been restored and converted into a private dwelling. We find ourselves in some deep Warren-like lanes now and a remote posting for the crossing keeper who was posted here on Cockmill Lane. Remnants of the crossing gates are still to be found among the undergrowth. And yet, for all the apparent seclusion, this barrier reminds us that we are in fact on the perimeter of the Glastonbury Festival site, through which the railway once passed. Emerging on the other side of the festival site one and a half miles later, we see that the track bed at this point has become a beautifully framed sylvan scene. We arrive at our next station, West Pennant. Like Pill, the buildings are now in private ownership, with the station master's house to the left of the picture and the main station building off centre to the right. Departing West Pennant, Trains began a four-mile journey which ran as straight as a die until it reached the outskirts of Glastonbury. Upon reaching Glastonbury, the railway then took a dramatic southerly curve. Today, the track is home to the A39, which runs along the town's western margin. And so we reach Glastonbury and Street, which was once the biggest station on the branch between Evercreech and Burnham. The station boasted substantial facilities for the handling of goods and was quite ornate in its construction. Sadly, along with the rest of the railway, these buildings are now long gone. Save for the crossing gates, which still stand over Dye House Lane. At this point in our journey, we diverge from the line to Burnham and explore the line to Wells, which originated from Glastonbury. In so doing, we briefly retrace our course along the A39, but continue north instead of bearing east for Evercreech Junction. Looking south, this is the view of the track bed from Chasey's Drove. And here, the view north. After a mile, we reach the site of Polsham Station. 
The only intermediary stop on the Wells branch, Polsham closed in October 1951. The station had a 200 foot long platform and a single siding. We faced north towards Wells where the track bed is now a garden belonging to the former station. From the top of Burkett Lane Bridge we take in the railway's course. Between Burkett Lane Bridge and Wells, access to the track bed is limited and remains of the railway slight. So it is that we reach the branch's terminus. Wells Priory Road was one of three stations serving this small cathedral city, and here we see the station after closure to passengers. Not the finest shot of the site today, but the builder's merchants sits on the location of the former goods shed, with the site of the station itself now demolished and overbuilt by road. The branch to Wells represented the first major closure for the Somerset and Dorset Railway in 1951, beginning an unfortunate and protracted decline for the railway at large. With Glastonbury Tour on the horizon, we find ourselves on the branch to Highbridge and Burnham once more, where we encounter this fine relic of the line in the form of Bridge 268. For the next several miles the landscape changes significantly, as the railway entered the Somerset levels, characterised by its peat bogs and willow growth. Here the trackbed survives as a path through the Avalon marshes. and remnants of the railway are still to be found. We reach our next station. Originally Ashcott and Mere, the latter part of the name was dropped in 1876. The station was equipped with a 10 lever ground frame controlling the adjacent crossing and good siding. The wooden platform was located to the left of the picture. All that stands of the station today is this level crossing gatepost. And so our journey continues across the Somerset levels, where the railway shadowed the course of South Drain. We reach Shapwick Station some four and a half miles from Glastonbury. Closed on the 7th of March 1966, the station comprised two platforms with a passing loop and a wooden station building. Every vestige of the station has long since been swept away. Eddington Junction, originally Eddington Road and later Eddington Birtle, represents a brief departure from our journey to Burnham, as it was the point at which, until 1952, one could alight for services on the branch to Bridgewater. Today, all that remains of the station is the Station Master's House, where we begin our brief southwesterly excursion to Bridgewater. Trains for Bridgewater turned south and crossed the bridge demolished in the years since the line's closure. For the next two miles, like elsewhere on the route, the track bed is now overgrown or else filled in. One can just imagine a near empty passenger train steaming and clanking gently along this line on a summer's day, meandering unhurriedly towards the next station. And so it is we arrive at Cossington some four miles northeast of Bridgewater. The attractive station house looks much as it did when it first opened on the 21st of July, 1890. 
Our train continued its southwesterly journey along what is now a footpath. Opened in 1923, we reached Bordrip Halt. Situated in the centre of this delightful village, the station had a relatively brief 31-year life, closing on the 1st of December 1952. We stand facing the direction of travel, with the temporary barriers roughly marking out the situation of the single platform. Departure from the station saw trains immediately cross bridge number 306 over Bordrip Lane. With bridge 306 at the centre of the picture, we can clearly see the alignment from this satellite view. Travelling southwest, trains would cross bridge number 307 over King Sedgemore Drain. Then beneath bridge 308, under what is now the A39. Crossing over Horsey Lane on the level, we then find the trackbed bisected by the M5, which heralds her entry into Bridgewater. The M5 can be seen and heard in the background as we view the railway's course from King's Drive. Facing west from the same spot, part of the railway's route into the town is now a footpath. But beyond this, all signs of the railway have been lost. And so we reach the site of Bridgewater North. This picture of the station was taken in 1963. The station, of an island design, struck north to the right of the picture beyond the building, where one would also find sidings serving the substantial brickworks and the wharves beyond. In its place now, a supermarket serves customers rather than passengers. We return to Eddington Junction, beginning our final leg of the journey to Burnham-on-Sea. Opened in 1856, Basin Bridge was made up of a single platform and limited platform buildings, with the station master's house offset at the station's western end. Its principal revenue was the transportation of milk, owing to the presence of the United Dairies factory, located opposite the station on its eastern end. The station closed to goods traffic in 1963 and passengers in 1966. However, the line between here and Highbridge remained open until 1972, allowing the transportation of milk from the factory to reach the main line and beyond. Named Highbridge East to distinguish it from the existing Bristol to Taunton line platforms, which are still operational, it became a passenger terminus of the line in 1951, after the closure of Burnham to passengers. We face west in this picture, but behind us there was once the vast Highbridge works, the headquarters for the Joint Railway's maintenance and repair of its locomotives and rolling stock. The works closed in 1930, losing 300 employees their jobs. The same view today. Gone are the five platforms, and all traces of the railway's substantial presence, from its sidings, to its works, to its wharves. The final part of our journey now, and here, s and trains crossed the main line on the level for goods access to Highbridge Wharf and, until 1951, passenger traffic for Burnham. The track bed into Burnham proper is now a footway and cycle path. As mentioned, the plan had been that steamships from Wales would deliver passengers across the Bristol Channel to Burnham-on-Sea. From thence, they would continue their journey across the levels and down the S&D's main line to Bournemouth, where they could enjoy England's shores or else make way for France. When the poet John Betjeman visited the Highbridge branch line in the summer of 1962, he found this sad road to the sea was in a state of decline. 
In the film documenting his journey, he addresses the people of Burnham, whose seaside station had not seen regular passenger traffic since 1951. When the roads are so full, he remarks, you'll be grateful to still have a railway to your town. Don't let Dr. Beeching take it away from you. But the wheels were already in motion. Notwithstanding the removal of express passenger trains on the railway's Bath to Bournemouth line in 1963, Dr. Richard Beeching had, at the request of the then government, issued his report entitled The Reshaping of British Railways, which recommended the closure of nearly 2,500 stations and 5,000 miles of line. Though a campaign to save the Somerset and Dorset Railway was mounted, it was no match for Transport Secretary Barbara Castle, who decreed that, in accordance with Dr Beeching's report, the railway, like so many others up and down the country, would close. Despite small sections of the line remaining open for a further few years to serve local goods traffic, the railway at large ceased operations and came to an end on the 7th of March 1966. Burnham-on-Sea station saw seasonal passenger excursions after its 1951 closure, until these two concluded in 1963. By this point, the Somerset and Dorset Railway had but three years of life left in it. Your hopes have died. They flow like driftwood down the tide, out, out into the open sea. O oh, sad forgotten S and D. I hope you enjoyed this film. Please subscribe, click the notification bell, follow and share Rediscovering Lost Railways.